Wednesday night fellowship Bible study time, a time that we're going to spend in the Lord, time that I hope that you are ready and that you are eager to hear what the Lord has to say to the body of Christ. I was in prayer a little while ago and I asked the Lord uh, if he would come and, and give, us, um, give us some illumination tonight. You know, we are in times where perhaps uh, some of the, the, the greatest moves of God are happening, but they're happening in, in, in ways that are not usual, they're not predictable, but when the Lord had prophesied to us this year what he did, as he does uh, usually on the top of the year, and we braced ourselves for difficult times knowing that he had promised us that though it, is, it will be difficult and there will be challenges, if we keep our ears open, we won't suffer harm and we won't suffer loss. So because of that, I want to really thank God for his provision, for his ability to protect the church. Uh, and we have, uh, and we're still alive and we're still here and we will continue to be here as long as there are people who love the Lord. Uh, and I hope that all of you are with me on that tonight. Uh, I want to also uh, thank God for, for all of you for continuing to, to support the ministry um, and to, to give out of your heart. I want to uh, open up and in, in, in helping you to understand how vital and how important you are, especially you who are watching online. Uh, my Wednesday audience, I consider, I really, really, um, you are dear to my heart. I don't get the chance to physically see you. But when I tell you that I can feel you, I really, really can. And the Spirit of God uh, will work to make sure that even though we are in a virtual connection, that that connection will continue to be real, okay? He had promised us something. He said, wherever there are two or three gathered in my name, there will I be in the midst of that connection. And so because we are connected, and, and here's how crazy that it is, you might come in and watching live, but someone else might come in and watch tomorrow because that's when they have off, because they're working now. And, but because of their connection and because they are in it, the Lord will continue to honor that. See, the Lord is not trapped by the parameters of time and space and matter. And so when, when we are in a position to say where there are two or three gathered in my name, it could be that it's a recording and I'm in agreement now, but you're going to be in agreement in 24 hours. The Lord still honors that because he's not constrained by time. We cannot be in two places at once. He can. We cannot, we cannot be in two times at once. He can. And so never place restrictions on God because God is sovereign. He's sovereign. He's true whether you believe him or not. He's powerful whether you believe it or not. You don't alter his existence or his flow or his attitude or his way of being at all. The only thing that we can do is benefit from who he is in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I plan on benefiting 100%. So um, if, you, if you would consider tonight, I really would uh, ask you to, um, if this is your first time watching online with us, I would ask you to consider a one-time offering, a one-time uh, love offering of whatever the Lord has put in your heart. You know, Sunday I had mentioned a scripture where it had, it had told us that um, there was going to be a famine prophesied in the New Testament. And uh, they took action because they understand that there was going to be great hunger uh, in the body of Christ and those that are connected to the body would suffer. And the Bible said that the disciples decided in their heart what they should do, each one according to their ability. And I think that's what uh, this opportunity to give is. I believe it's an opportunity. I believe it's what, when we come together, we have to decide each one what we can do. But I don't want it to be lost on you that God is watching the Bible said that he was watching from across the way as people were giving into the treasury. And he saw how some people gave out of their wealth. But then he saw this woman who gave all that she had. She only had two mites. Okay? And she put in that, which to other people is nothing, but to her is everything. And I thought it was peculiar uh, and super interesting that Jesus was watching that as if he was... He, he was seeing that, man, that convicts me. Every time I feel like I'm overspending money, every time I think I'm buying something that is completely vain and unnecessary, I always picture that like, man, I, God is watching. I, I, when I see a dime or something of value, I don't throw it away because I know that the Lord is watching. He wants us to prosper by us being 
um, fruitful. He wants us to prosper by us not overspending. He wants us to prosper by us being people of principle. Amen? So uh, we, we will open up, open up uh, the opportunity to give now. You can text how NJ to 77977. Uh, you text how NJ to 77977. If not, you can also download the app. So if you're watching us on TV, you can use another device uh, and you can download the House of Worship app. We're proud of it and we're hope, hoping that you can download that as well. Amen. Praise God. Welcome to some of y'all. Uh, I see some of you. I see my sister Hannah and Minister Denise and Brother Gerald. God bless you, brother. Hope the family's doing well. Amen. My sister Nancy and how are you, Christina? God bless you. Amen. Hey, Monica. All right, my sister Inger in the house. Pastor Murley's in the house. Brother Jamel. Amen. Jamel's in the house. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. Who else have I not seen in a while? Amen. My sister Yahida. What's up, Lisa? God bless you. Sister Lisa Camarado's in the house in Skyland. Brother Reuben. Amen. Grace. God bless you guys. Amen. Y'all in the house. Hey, now remember, I can't, I can't big you up if you don't say hi first, right? So there's a lot of people watching, but, you know, some of y'all are shy. Amen. But if you know me, you know, I grew up in church. I love the saints. Okay. We, we, we grew up greeting each other and not the way that you guys are used to. We grew up uh, kissing each other on the cheek. In Spanish, it's called un osculo santo. It's a gre it's when the Bible said greet each other with a holy kiss. And so we would really do that. It was really beautiful and, and it was innocent. It was the, I grew up in church in the 80s, uh, and I didn't think that was nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, and so now, you know, after COVID, all of that stuff kind of went away. Uh, but I still feel like that. I still feel like there's a bond that needs to happen um, in the presence of the Lord. So let's give, let's pray for that. I hope that you would consider if you're also not a first time uh, audience, but you are a part of the house of God, I pray that you would consider, amen, giving and supporting the house of the Lord. If you didn't get a chance to give on Sunday, then here's a wonderful opportunity. And I want to be able to pray for that seed uh, at this moment. Father, we bless you. We bless you. Our desire is that you be with us every single day, that in everything that we do, that in all the opportunities that fall on our lap, be the blessing. We see you as the one who warns us when trouble is coming. We see you as the one who prepared us for other blessings, who lets us know that something big is coming whether it's good or bad, whether it is convenient or whether it is inconvenient, you never leave your people in the dark. For that, we thank you. You are worthy, Father, to be praised. And you are worthy that we continue to support this ministry and to support the place where you have set us up to be. It is so important because most of our lives are lost until we get in the right place and it becomes the right time for us. And for many of us, this is what it is. We're going to talk about the word tonight, and I pray that you may bless it. But before we go into that, consider our jobs, consider our careers, our opportunities, those that work for a company and those that are entrepreneurs and work for themselves, those that have goals and they have dreams, they have side jobs, they have a job, a part-time job, and they Uber on the side. Whatever we have to do to make ends meet, I pray, Lord God, that you may take us from fighting to make ends meet into times of prosperity. I pray that you may make us strong and make us help us to be good stewards of the money and of the income that comes in. Give us better strategies and help us to be bold and not fearful because scared money cannot reproduce bold money. Anything that we have fear with only reproduces more fear. But when we become bold, then we are blessed by reproducing boldness. So we pray, Lord God, that this may be according to your will. And we ask you, Lord God, now that you may open up the windows of heaven and give us a word from heaven, one that we can digest and one that we can fight with every single day to help us to understand who we are and to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. All right. Now, we had a wonderful time on Sunday. We baptized um, a family, and we baptized one of our brothers who is 
uh, Jimmy, who's going to get married uh, this weekend. What a wonderful thing just to have that set up. Make sure that, you know, as a man that you are right with God and you are married uh, to the kingdom before you marry, you know, in, 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 on, on the earth. And I believe that those who are baptized on Sunday, I just saw something special about them. So if you would do me a favor, continue to pray for them, okay? Keep, keep these families in prayer. Keep these individuals in prayer because the Lord had prophesied over them. And we know that the Lord prophecies are 100% going to come to pass. But sometimes the enemy gets a hold of people and really messes with them. So uh, let's pray for them. Let's keep them in prayer for the next 90 days that they may launch their career in the Lord uh, with all grace, with speed, and no distractions on the way, but that they may catch a momentum uh, in their lives. Amen. I want us to go to the scripture. I, I, I want to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. This is the scripture that is famous for talking about seasons and talking about time. And I, I, I want to use this to speak about this dynamic that we have um, of being a seed, of having seedlings within us, and the power that God has to reproduce things inside of us. I want to go over that process because sometimes we are disconnected to the process of growth, and we get so over hyper focused on the present. And it is good to be present. It's good to know what's going on, to have self-awareness, uh, to be quick and agile with your thinking. It's very, very good. But sometimes our situations don't make sense. Sometimes it seems like we should be further along. Sometimes we get anxiety because, you know, our, our position doesn't line up with what we have in mind. It can cause anxiety. It can sometimes cause depression because you can be so fired up and so prepared to do something, but the opportunity just doesn't show up. And many times you will wonder, God, why did you make me this way? Why did you make me so aggressive? Or why did you make me such a go-getter? Or why did you make me so committed to, to building a family? Yeah, I don't see a family yet. Why would you make me such a hard worker, but I don't have the money to open up my business yet? And you have me here working somewhere that it doesn't look like it has anything to do with my destiny. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 through 8, let's start to deal with this. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up where it is um, planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. Hmm. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to tear, um, yeah, to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. You know, sometimes I believe, first thank you Lord for your word. I have made the mistake of thinking that because of the New Testament that we are only set on one time, which is um, like that song says, don't worry, be happy. And that because we have Jesus in our lives, that we should only focus on being happy. We should only focusing, focus on uh, favor, showing favor to people, uh, being good, and all these kind of things. Um, and the Bible encourages us to do that. But once we study certain clues that Jesus gave us, we start to see that perhaps that the way that we have this perception about being a follower of Jesus is perhaps a little off or maybe a little skewed because of our personal beliefs that are actually disempowering us and getting into trouble because sometimes we are showing favor, being nice, over lending, okay, uh, uh, allowing certain grace that the Lord has not said it's time for that. 
See, when in Ecclesiastes is telling us, breaking everything down, that everything has a season, everything has a time. There's a time to keep, there's a time to throw away. There's a time to be, uh, to, to speak, and there's a time to be quiet. And sometimes there's also a time to do favors, and there's a time to let folks suffer. And let me explain that one. It isn't that we are called to be mean, we're not. We're called to have grace. We're not called to be arrogant. We're called to be humble. But there are times that sometimes we get in God's way because when God is trying to show someone a lesson, instead of that lesson coming through, what ends up happening is that we get in God's way. And I have done that many times that, that I have gone out of my way, helped someone, lend them money, and I didn't realize that the Lord was telling me don't do it because they're bad spenders and I'm trying to help them, but I need to humble them first. And here I come in as this try to be this, um, you know, fake savior trying to help them out of the situation because of myself. I was thinking about me, right? Like, man, I, I remember being in that situation. I don't want to be in that position. I don't want to see other people in that position. And what I should have done was just walked away. But instead, I engaged and I end up in a financial burden trying to help someone. Now, what happens there? What happens is I should have listened to the Lord. Because it isn't that the Lord is not going to help them. It is about the time of when he wants to do it. And many times we know that with our children, even though you want to maybe not want to hear them cry, but you know that if they don't toughen up and if they don't learn that, hey, you can't have everything you want whenever you want, they'll use their tears as manipulation, okay? Not in, a, not in an evil way. Okay, but they're children, they're toddlers, they're going to do what they got to do because that's their form of communication. And if you're a good parent, you understand that there's a time to pick them up and there's a time to say, I'm not going to pick you up. You need to go to sleep. Okay, you can't just do whenever. What, well, I just don't want to hear the child cry. You can ruin okay, a child and their, start their behavior. You can make them rude. Okay, you can make them unbearable just by what you continue to foster in them uh, and not apply discipline and so when a child has no reason to hold on to discipline once they grow older they're going to want to be disciplined and they're not going to have it in them because you never allowed the seed of discipline to grow the seed of discipline only grows when there are restrictions where there are clear boundaries that says, I'm not going to do this. I can't do this. So, that, so now when the child gets sick and the doctor says, hey, you can't have any sweets um, or you can't have this or you can't have that, the child has no discipline. They'll wake up in the middle of the night, look for a snack, and end up hurting themselves because you simply didn't want to hear them cry. And little things like this, we get ourselves in trouble in our relationship with Christ because we, God has a time for everything. Now, it's always time to be humble. It's always time to walk in the spirit. It is always time, Kate, to be fruitful. But when it comes to our interactions, things that are outside of us, we always have to depend on time. See, John Maxwell, Dr. John Maxwell said it best. He said he never had a problem with knowing what to do. He knew that perhaps in his business he'd have to fire someone. He knew that he would have to make this change. He knew that he would have to do these things in order for the project to prosper. However, what he only struggled with was not with the what to do, but the when to do it. See, timing is everything. And the Lord is telling us and setting us up tonight that timing is what makes things work well and not be obsolete. Uh, I heard someone say this week that, I believe it was a, a, a Billy, a friend of ours, Billy has said, I saw him say it, and he said that the opposite of success is not failure. Um, he said the opposite of success is obsolescence, is being obsolete, because the power of success is that you got things going, you have momentum, and now it is fruitful and useful, right? Because unless you're in a flow where you're providing services for someone and you are needed, then that is the success. That's why success is not always about money. Success can be about love, that you found the right connection of people who need some emotional things from you and you are able to give it to them at the right place at the right time. So you are in high value in people's lives. 
But when, they, when the opposite of that is that they don't need you. They don't need what you have to offer, and therefore that makes you obsolete. And so he made the case that obsolescence is the opposite of success. And I, and, and I thought that is so true. Many times we get stuck into thinking about success is just about money, but success is about being valued, about being needed, about who you are and what you offer is valuable right now, and it ain't going out of style. And if you can get yourself to be that, okay, then you will never be obsolete, neither in your family, neither in your business, in the marketplace, and especially in the kingdom of God. Amen? All right. Let's go deeper into this because I, I really feel like it's necessary for us to dive in a little deep. Um, I, I noticed that because of timing, some things can go from being a blessing to being a curse because you made the move too early. I don't know if this ever happened to you where you spoke too soon, where you knew it was the right decision, but your impulse made you do it before you were supposed to. And now what could have been a tremendous blessing has now collided because this mission was not supposed to go because you're, God was sending something else. And now, now two things have collided because of your impatience. Two things have collided because of your or our impulses. And so we have to constantly pray for the control over our emotions. Lord, help me to control my emotions. Because if I don't control my emotions, I'm going to continue to be impulsive. I'm going to continue to be the person that has no patience. And, and we understand, not just because it says in the Bible, but in real life, patience is a virtue. The ability to wait, the ability to not freak out and not lose control while you're waiting on something to manifest in your life, while you're waiting on God's promises to show up. You have to have patience and never lose the ability to wait. The Bible tells us the benefit of waiting, that those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I don't know about you, but... I'm constantly needing to renew my strength, man, how often? Every single day, okay? When you live a life of high output, when you want to live a life high output, high risk, high reward, um, you want to be highly effective, you're going to be drained every single day because it takes energy to be effective, okay? Now, God gives us energy, because the Bible says that he gives us the power, okay, to gain wealth. Now, when we get our, when we talk about the energy company, we call them sometimes the power company. When we turn on the lights, we say, turn the power on, okay? Or, or when we turn the breaker, we say, turn the power on. But really, power and energy, we call it power, but we're getting charged an energy bill. So the two words are interchangeable between energy and power. So... If I was to say this, God gives us the energy to get wealth, then I think you would agree with me that it takes on a completely new meaning. Because power can be misinterpreted as overpowering, overbearing, um, inappropriate, uh, perhaps someone who wants to lord over people, okay, greedy. But if we were to understand that the actual translation of what the Bible was saying wasn't about lording over anyone, it was about the energy. Why? Because in order for you to be successful in anything in life, whether it's you want to join a baseball team, you want to be a coach, you want to be a good mom, you want to be a good entrepreneur, you want to be a tremendous minister, you want to put together a good Bible study, whatever tasks you want to do, if you want to be successful, is going to require concentration, and it's going to require a lot of concentration. And even if you have concentration, but you don't have the gifting, you won't make it. So it is necessary to understand that when God blesses you, how is the blessing coming to pass? See, we are his children. It's our task to pray. Is his task to respond yes or no. What we don't get to do is to tell him when. Because the when is in his time. He's the only one that knows what we don't see. He's the one that knows what we don't know. He knows who's coming and he knows who's leaving. 
He knows what's coming down the pipeline, okay, what laws are about to be passed. He knows the backroom deals that are happening in the White House. He knows all that is happening, and when he blesses you, he keeps all that stuff in mind. So here's what happens. You might pray, and the Lord says yes, and you see nothing happening. You see nothing happening. Matter of fact, you might see your life gets a little harder. You might see challenges. And you might get confused and say, hey, wait a minute. I just prayed to get some relief and God sending me some problems. And, and, and if I didn't know the Lord, I would say, yeah, that's a problem. But now that I know the Lord, I realize that that is his style. His style is to bring up problems before he brings blessings. Why? Because the problems come with solutions. See, one of the things that I want you to understand tonight, and I want you to take notes on this, I want you to write down in your notes, God wants me to be solution-oriented. Okay? Write this down. Solutions-oriented. I want you to be the type of person that is always focused on solutions. Okay? Uh, why? Because there's either problems that cannot be solved or problems that can be solved. And the difference is who's looking at the problem. Usually, the person who is solutions oriented will always get the problem solved because they're constantly in every situation, 24 hours a day, looking for solutions. Okay? Uh, I, was, I was looking at, you know, I wanted the remote control. I was looking for the fire stick. I couldn't find it. So I had two options. I'm like, hey, I can yell at everyone, try to find it, and ruin my night, and, you know, kind of mess up my back. I don't want to stand up. My feet hurt. But I can download. I think the phone has an app that I can download. For sure, the technology exists. I went online. I looked at the app store. I found it, and I was able to control it. Why? Because I am solution-oriented. I don't want to be a whiner-oriented. I don't want to be complaint-oriented. I want to be a solution-oriented person. I want to always look for solutions. If you ask me for hand soap and there's only dish soap, I'm going to take the dish soap, I'm going to water down a little bit, and I'm going to say, here's some custom-made hand soap. Why? Because I don't want to say, we don't got none. No, we do have it. It's in another form, but I found a solution. If the solution is you want to wash your hands, maybe I don't have something that says hand soap, but I got something that can take care of the situation. See, sometimes we get stuck in our mind because if we don't have the exact little thing that we're looking for, we say there ain't none. It doesn't exist. And God works with solution-oriented people. People that understand perhaps what you need is not going to come in a bottle with the name on it. So you're going to have to put some ingredients together and, and customize your deliverance. You're going to have to customize the bailout. You're going to have to customize how to get your family out of the situation. Because maybe they're not going to give you an offer for, for a promotion. Maybe, maybe, you're, uh, maybe you're in a church that is stuck. And maybe the pastor's not going to change. You're paying for the change. God's like, no, I don't want him to change. I want you to come out with solutions. And instead of God changing people, what he does, he starts to change you and he will frustrate you. For what reason? So that you can find solutions to the problem because the blessing is in the solution. But the solution doesn't show up unless there's a problem to be solved. So stop being whining oriented, complaint oriented. Eliminate words like I cannot. Eliminate it can't be done because just because you can't get it done and you can't see it doesn't mean that someone else can. Most of the time when you just are facing a challenge and you step away from it, go get some iced tea, come back, and all of a sudden you see it differently. We are in a season where God is constantly training people so that things that don't make sense will start to make sense real soon. You see... The Bible talks about seeds. Jesus said it best. Unless a seed goes in the ground, it cannot bear fruit. What can you do with a seed out of the ground? How, how good is a seed outside of the ground? Yeah, I think I, I can hear somebody thinking about it. 
Pastor, there's no use for a seed outside the ground. Okay, unless it's like a pumpkin seed or sunflower seed that you can actually have fun eating the seed. Okay, usually um, seeds are completely useless unless you plant them. However, the seed has tremendous value. Why? Because the seed has everything that's going to be in that tree is hidden in the seed. And the seed doesn't even make sense until it's in the ground. There are certain things that are in your life that don't make sense because you're not in the right place and it isn't the right time. See, you put a seed in the ground, you have to make sure that the soil is good. And based on the preparation of the soil, the success of that seed is going to be based on the success of the soil. So we can't just have good seed, we have to have good soil, we have to have a watering system, and we need light. So we need to plug in this seed in an ecosystem that is going to grow and germinate and basically do what it has to do. I want you to look at yourself as a seed. If you were a seed, how could you be fruitful? Well, Jesus said that he must die and that he, like a seed, must go into the ground and then he will bear fruit. And his disciples didn't want to see him go, but he understood, I am in seed form. I can preach all day. I can heal all day. I can do everything I want. But as Jesus in seed form was never going to save the world. The only way that he was going to save the entire planet, all generations before him and after him, was going to be by him planting himself in the ground. And to that, it means literally death. And because he did that, he rose, and the type of fruit that he bears is changes the world. That's how powerful it is. So maybe we're not going to be as powerful as that, or we're not giving us such an opportunity, but understand that everything that God sets you up for is for tremendous benefit to you, to your family, and to everyone else that he has called uh, to himself. So if he looked at himself as a seed, then it's fair to say that people are seeds too. Jesus' situation, his suffering, didn't make sense until the seed went into the ground. All of his parables, all the, all the sermons, everything that he was saying didn't make sense until he was in the right place. And the Lord prepared a place for him. And that place was the tomb. And he stayed there and resurrected for the evidence of his love, the testimony of his sacrifice, and his enduring consistency to do what he said he was going to do. Amen? So, so it didn't make sense. David's situation. It didn't make sense that this boy is so overqualified. Okay? It didn't make sense that this shepherd can play a, a harp of all things. A harp? The harp didn't make sense until the Lord put a, a spirit in Saul to annoy him and to frustrate him. And, and they had to find someone that can play the harp. So they found David, this overqualified shepherd boy that does not look like he is who he says he is. We didn't find out until there was a need. The need brought out who David was. And now we saw him as a minister of music. Now he goes, and we didn't find out that David was fighting lions and bears until he manifested it. When Saul asked him, are you sure? I don't think you can handle this. And he said, look at who I am. I do this, this, and this. All of that extra overqualified shepherding didn't make sense until Goliath showed up. Him playing the heart didn't make sense until he sent them to, to check out how else was God going to get David into the castle, into the palace, and prepare him to be king if he had no exposure, if he didn't know anyone. He needed him to build relationships. He needed him to start getting trusted. He needed him to, to be liked. And so he found the way. So he put seed inside David so that when the opportunity arose... All of a sudden, his playing, his defending, his zealousness for his father's house, all of that came into use when he found the right place and God put him and called him at the right time. 
Look at Peter and Paul. Jesus' two top picks, arguably two top picks in the New Testament, okay? Probably two of the most significant figures in, in all of Christianity. And these two guys had temper problems, okay? They were in seed form hotheads, passionate, aggressive, but it didn't make sense. All this aggression to get himself almost locked up when he went and cut the ear off of that soldier. It didn't make sense. All of this extra aggression, all this extra attitude and want to go get it. He walks on water. Peter, why are you like this? It doesn't make sense. It looks, Peter, like all you're doing is getting yourself into trouble. Peter, maybe you're living the wrong life. Peter, maybe you picked the wrong career. Peter, I don't know. Maybe, maybe did Jesus make a mistake? See, a lot of stuff didn't make sense about Peter until Jesus said, upon this house, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now it started to make sense. Who's going to lead this illegal movement at the time? Who is going to not care about getting caught? Who's the one that doesn't care about the authorities that will step to them? And, and who's going to be brave enough? Oh, all of a sudden, the guy who cut the ear off, who's not afraid of authorities, all of a sudden, Peter makes sense as a top pick. Paul didn't make sense because... How are you a Jew, you love God, you're zealous, but you're after them trying to kill him, and you won't stop? His, his, his aggression, his attitude, the way he did things didn't make any sense. So how could he be a Christian with all that extra attitude? Oh, but when, he had, when we needed a guy who was a Roman citizen, who knew how to address Kings and princes and Herod and Pilate. He knew how to address all these people because he was highly educated. See, before the opportunity showed up, it just looked like he was overzealous, overqualified, okay? And, and he was just bored and had nothing to do. He was too much, right? Paul, you're doing too much. All of a sudden, Paul becomes an apostle. And now we need someone who is so aggressive that, and concentrated that they will follow this agenda without fail for years in the face of threat of prison, in the face of every type of threat that was thrown at him. Who was going to do this job? All of a sudden, this Paul who was nuts, who everybody wanted to get rid of, is now in high demand because in seed form, he was extra. But once God planted him in position, he became the perfect person for the job, that there would have been never anyone else higher qualified for his position if it wasn't for him. Look at Stephen, who was the first martyr, who, who, who had this knowledge of scriptures, perhaps because he was a Jew and they probably already knew that, hey, we have a relationship with God. We don't have to work all that hard. But his memory of scriptures showed when he had to face the hypocrisy of the, of the Jewish leadership. Now, all of a sudden, everything that he did, everything that might have been extra, is exactly what's needed for right now. How about Moses? Moses goes and, uh, and he's famous because he wanted to save his people too early. And so he, he, he's exiled because in a moment that he saw one of the Egyptian soldiers um, whipping and bullying and mistreating, harassing one of the Hebrews, he got involved and, and, and it ended up with the uh, Egyptian getting killed. And he thought he did a good thing. He wanted to protect the Hebrews. He wanted them to have a better life. Perhaps he wanted them to not be slaves anymore. But it would have been impossible. So it was like, Moses, what are you doing? It doesn't make sense what you're doing. All you're going to do is get kicked out of here. Oh, but it started to make sense later. When, when God needed someone who loved the Hebrews so much and knew the palace in and out, that had connections, he needed to send someone else that was highly qualified for that. Now, all of a sudden, Moses makes sense. Esther didn't make sense. Mordecai's story didn't make sense. 
uh, uh, the whole story about Joseph is incredibly abusive. And, and it looks like everything's going wrong for this guy and we should really help him. But all of his problems made sense when there was a famine in the land. Now all of a sudden, this guy who gets favor, this guy who's a solution-oriented person, this guy who goes to jail and becomes top dog in the jail, this guy who goes, gets sold into slavery into Potiphar's house, becomes the chief administrator of Potiphar's house, and now it makes sense. We need a guy like that to take care of the country and the GDP and the production of the wheat, and guess what they do? All of a sudden, when you get Joseph out of prison, Joseph makes sense. Now it makes sense. The only way he was going to be in that position was for him to be forced into it. The only way for his name to show up is if all these things happen to him. Ruth, Ruth, Ruth's gift didn't make sense. Okay, John, his situation didn't make sense. When you look at all the Bible characters, without the time and place that they were called as a seed form, we can't figure you out. What about you? What is it about you that in your circumstances frustrates you because you believe I'm better than this? I'm more than this. I got more in me than this. I don't feel like I'm going to die here. I, this can't be my last dance. This can't be my, my this, this, I'm not going to end like this. I know I started this job and I know I'm, I'm, I'm in my 50s, but I got something else in me. Something about my life doesn't make sense. And I will say to you, you are probably right. But it's going to make sense real soon. I, I want you to write that down. It will make sense. It'll make sense real soon. Because I believe God is transitioning his people to be in the right place. Bishop Del Bronner says something I thought was, was fantastic. He said, God always created the place before he created the man. He said he created the garden before he created the man. And even, even when he created the vegetation, the Bible said that it did not produce because there was no man to till the ground. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. See, all of our sacrifices don't make sense right now. All the suffering that we're doing doesn't make sense right now. Perhaps all of this refraining from sin and all of this, you know, abuse that we have to take and all of these, all of this moments that we have to bite our tongue and not say anything, it doesn't make sense, but it's going to make sense real soon. Because once you get to the other side and we are with the Lord, all of a sudden, a lot of things are going to make sense because you realize, wait a minute, my whole life was a seed preparing me for such a time as this. So as it will be in, the, in, 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 in heaven, so is it going to be here on earth. You have not seen, the Bible said, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared. What is he preparing? A place. There is a place for you in heaven and there's a place for you here that you are uniquely fitted to fit that situation. There's going to be things about you, you man. I talk too much, man. You know, I, I'm, I'm too excited. Man, I, I, I don't know why I'm so passionate. You know, I, I get on people's nerves all the time. I don't know why I'm this. I don't know why I'm that. I don't know why I'm always on time. I'm always, I, I annoy myself because I can't stand to be late. All of your pet peeves, all, all, all of your habits, things that you think are extra about you, it's about to make sense real soon. You know, nothing in me when I was growing up uh, prepared me to be a pastor, at least in my head. I had this list of things that I thought, hey, these guys must have this and this and this and this type of preparation. And then I realized that after a while, God was training me to be a pastor in things that had nothing to do with being a pastor. Because had he done that to me, I would have ran away. I would have skipped class if he told me, hey, you're gonna, you're, I'm going to teach you this because this is where you're going to end up. He couldn't do that because he knew I wouldn't have went for it. 
So what he had to do was prepare me on this third party situation. Prepare me to solve problems on this side of the fence. Prepare me to be a solution oriented person. Prepare me for leadership and sales. Prepare me uh, to deal with people, okay, uh, uh, and, and on the entrepreneur side, to, to get me used to certain uh, problem solving situations, conflict resolutions, all these things. And he never told me the end game. He just says, you need this for now. And he set me up uh, on, on a sales gig for me to prepare to be a pastor. Because I thought all the preparation was about making money. No, 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 no. He said, no, no, no. This is the thing I'm going to use to train you for the thing that you don't know you want yet. But if I tell you what it is, you're going to get scared and you're going to skip class. So I'm going to make you, I'm going to give you a scenario that looks like that's the end game. So you can go for it with all of your heart. But at the end, that ain't the thing. It's just the thing that leads to the thing. And I wish, I wish we would thank God more, not for the thing, but for the thing that led to the thing. Sometimes you can't just get married. Sometimes you got to go through a horrible relationship because the horrible relationships prepare your heart for scenarios that otherwise you would have ruined the woman that God is going to send. You would have ruined the man that God was going to send because you didn't know how to handle it. And sometimes I've seen God set up mock trial relationships so that you can ruin them. So when the real one comes, you go, uh oh, I'm not going to do what I did last time. I'm not going to, I'm going to kill all these bad habits. I don't want to lose this person. And all of a sudden, all of your trials, all of your tribulations make sense. Some of you are leaders and you're being trained in leadership. And it doesn't make sense because you're not in a position to be a leader. But I want to encourage you tonight. Keep doing what God has put you in position for. Because it's only a matter of time. It's just a sudden switch. It's going to be a suddenly. It's going to be without. All of a sudden you're going to be in a situation that you have never found yourself before. And to your amazement, you are going to be a perfectly qualified to handle that problem because that is the evidence of your gift. That is the evidence of your calling. When God presents to you a problem that you are uniquely positioned to resolve. When God delivers you a person that you are uniquely qualified to minister to. When God delivers a business an opportunity, something that is like, wait a minute, this thing is a triangle, and I'm a triangle shape, and I fit exactly here. This thing is a circle, and I'm a circle shape, and I fit exactly there. Like, that's what I see in the spirit right now. Some of you don't are frustrated because you're a square trying to fit into a triangle. Stop getting frustrated about the triangle and wait for the square. Wait for the rectangle. Wait for your shape to come. When we was playing a uh, stickball in the street, we would get frustrated because we only had three strikes. And sometimes the guys who weren't that good, they would waste all of their swings on stuff that uh, they didn't have to swing. And so we would tell them, wait for your pitch. You got three strikes. Don't swing three times. You got four balls, okay? Uh, and and you, you, can, you can wait, okay? And I saw that the kids who were impatient, they swung at anything. But the seasoned kids, they would wait for their pitch. They would wait for it. And you'd see them. What are they doing? Studying the pitcher. How are you coming at me? How do you stand? Gauging the distance, gauging the speed. And then when their confidence matched the possibility of the hit, take a swing. Sometimes we're not applying these principles. The only principle that we imply is impatience. The only principle that we imply is impulse. And that's why we are not happy with the outcome of our life. And then when you do fit, you don't even enjoy it because you're so overwhelmed and disappointed by everything else. My challenge for you today is to chill. 
Wait on the Lord. Okay? Watch what he's going to do. It's going to amaze you. you. He already made you. He already gave you the promise. He gave you the gifts. Okay? When you got baptized, the Bible said you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your household and all that are far off. So you have a gift in you. He gave gifts to men. But don't be frustrated because it's not manifesting yet. You don't need it to manifest until the right place and the right time appears. Otherwise, you will not grow and your seed will not germinate. It won't throw its first root. Why? Wrong soil. Why? Wrong temperature. Wrong. Uh, why? The, the, there's no moisture in the dirt. The situation, the scenario is not ready yet. Why do we want things before it is going to be 100% optimal? I'd rather wait for 100% optimal. I don't want a 50% blessing. I don't want to... Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't work. I don't want an early blessing either. And we should pray that, Lord, don't give us no early blessings. We want on-time word. We want on-time blessings. Lord, only thing I want you to help me with is help me with my ears so I can hear what I got to hear. Help me with my eyes so I can see what I got to see. Help me with my spirit so I can feel and discern in my spirit when I got to take a move. Because our problem isn't what to do, our problem is when to do it, when to pull the trigger. And I pray that God would program our hearts, our minds, and our trigger finger that we don't shoot too early and miss. That we don't get impatient and that when, that when the opportunity comes, we're so discouraged that we have no energy to do the thing that he called us to do. Man, but for some of you who have been praying and fasting and waiting on the Lord, I want to tell you something prophetic. It's going to make sense real soon. Your life, your situation, your struggle, all the things that you went through that did not make sense. It's about to make sense real soon. And you're going to sit there, you're going to look at the mirror and say, oh, my God, I am uniquely qualified to handle this thing. Oh my goodness, I am uniquely qualified to be with this person. I am uniquely qualified to, 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 be, um, to be a partner in this endeavor. You'll be sitting and testifying, and you'll be in the restaurant across from somebody who's a waiter, and they're having a hard time, and then all of a sudden you realize, I'm the perfect person to talk to this individual. I have gone through exactly what they're saying. Let me tell you something. If that hasn't happened to you, it will. And it is the most satisfying feeling in the world to be in the right place at the right time and to be uniquely qualified to do the thing that needs to be done right now. You don't know that you have the courage until the position shows up. You don't know that you have the grace until the position shows up. God is about to put you in position. He's about to put you in place. Because the place is what makes you make sense. The timing is what's going to make you make sense. See, before it's like, man, I went through that for nothing. That was a waste. That was too much. David could have easily said, you know what? It wasn't worth the fighting lions and bears. They were just sheep. They could have made up more. Why did I have to do all of that? I was extra with it. Oh, but when he saw Goliath, some said, okay, now I understand why I had to mess with that lion. Now I understand why I had to go toe-to-toe go -to -toe with a bear because what I'm looking at right now, that stuff that I thought was a waste of time and it was too much and I was crying about it and I sat there in the middle of the night saying, God, why are you putting me through this? How come none of my other brothers you know, are, are out here? I'm out here by myself. Nobody's helping me. And, and he turned his whining into an asset. Everything he could have whined about, complained about, became his asset, made him famous, put him in a, in a place for fortune and fame, and it set him up to be the first actual anointed called and chosen king of Israel. So what about you? What about you? What about your seed? 
Are you going to shift into it? Are you going to be the person that controls their emotions, values what they have gone through, and say, Lord, I might not have liked it, but I know it was you who did the hookup. Amen? So I'm going to pray that the Lord would open up your heart and your mind so that you may see that he is for you, that he is with you. Amen? Father, I pray, Lord God, for the timing that you have for us. I know, Lord God, that my brothers and my sisters are going through it. They're going through it, but it ain't for nothing. Nothing that we went through is wasted. Even when you did the miracle of with the two fish and the five loaves of bread, there was 12 baskets left, and you asked the disciples to pack it up, let, leave no crumbs, because what was in the loaf is still in the rest of the bread crumbs. Father, I pray right now, blessing over blessing for the people of Christ. Patience is a virtue. We need it back. We need to cut our impulses and we need to stick to what works. We need to be faithful. Bring us our courage back. Some of us have lost our courage because we're discouraged. We don't see it working. And it doesn't look like my style of person is needed anymore. I feel like I'm about to be obsolete. Oh, but I feel something coming, Jesus. I feel us going from obsolete to success. To going from unnecessary to highly valuable in the marketplace. But we have to trust you now. We have to trust you, heart and soul. No playing around this time, no games. We got to trust you with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And so, Father, we pray that this may be so. Bless us, bless us, O God. Let us not forget this word, but instead let it be concrete in our soul until we see who we are and why we are. Why are we this way? Why did you make us like this? We're going to about to find out real soon. We're going to find out real soon. Be with us, Lord, and rejoice with us. For the people have a mind to work and the people have a mind to grow and we will make it to the place that it is the perfect soil for us to plant ourselves. Thank you, Lord, because you have taught us to continue to be with the fellowship of the saints and to not stop coming to church as other people have a custom because this is the place where we make sense. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. God bless you guys. I love you. I'll be back here on Sunday. I anticipate having a wonderful service. I hope that you're really, really enjoying it. You know, we've been uh, uh, working with our, with our beloved sister, Felicia, um, and she is just helping us to do a wonderful job, uh, giving, giving our, our worship team a rest and uh, continue to pray for her as uh, her and her husband have, um, you know, really responded to my call and asked him to come and, and help me and with a couple of things. And they have just done and are doing above and beyond. So I want to shout them out and I want you to keep them in prayer. Uh, these are my brothers and sisters in Christ, yours as well. And they're highly valuable. I hope that we would, you know, be able to, uh, to appreciate them as we appreciate all of us. But sometimes, you know, God sends you some people and you got to love on them extra because God sent them to you. Amen. And I don't know about you, but when God sends me a gift, I'm going to cherish that thing all the way to the end. Amen. That's why I love you, because you sent you to me. And so I appreciate you 100%. Amen. God bless you guys. We love you. See you Sunday.